Hi everybody, welcome to lecture 2.2, Human Culture's Big Bang. So today we are going to talk about our ancestors' transition from being anatomically modern, as we've talked about in the past couple of lectures, to being behaviorally modern. This transition is associated with the development of symbolic systems like language and art, which we'll get into today as well as in lecture 2.3. So when we talk about behaviorally modern humans, we are primarily referring to our direct homo sapien ancestors living in Europe between about 40,000 and 10,000 years ago. We are particularly thinking here about this period as it pertains to Europe. Although, of course, uh, Homo sapiens are living throughout the old world in both Africa and Europe and Eurasia uh, and are beginning to spread out and populate other further afield places. But for today, we're really just going to focus on Europe. So in terms of time period, we are going to focus on what's called the Upper Paleolithic, which is defined as that period between 40,000 and 10,000 years ago. So during this particular time period in the Paleolithic, we have a couple of different kind of phenomena happening. First, we see climate becoming more temperate. We also see that humans are starting to live in more permanent settlements. And we see a diversification in the types of stone tools and other types of material culture being produced by our hominin ancestors. So during this time period, Homo sapiens are pretty much anatomically modern. What this means is that they had large brains, they had anatomical bipedalism, they had opposable thumbs, and smaller guts, jaws, and teeth. Around 40,000 years ago, our Homo sapien ancestors also developed behavioral traits similar to ours. Specifically, they gained the capacity to act in culturally learned ways, dependent on full human language and the use of abstract symbols. Think the alphabet. Behaviorally modern, is, behavioral modernity is also linked to the capacity for, and spirit, for spiritual thought. So this means that our hominin ancestors during this time period were moving beyond just thinking about food and technology. This transition to being behaviorally modern is defined by a critical breakdown of what we might think of as our intellectual walls or what Stephen Mithin has called cognitive fluidity. So what we'll explore for the bulk of this lecture is why and how this cognitive fluidity occurred and that we see this kind of critical transition to behavioral modernity around 40,000 years ago associated with the Paleolithic. All right, so there's two different models to explain why and how this cognitive transition occurred in our Homo sapien ancestors. The first is a theory proposed by Stephen Mithin. So his theory uh, is called the theory of cognitive fluidity. And according to Mithin, the development of new types of intelligence and connections across intelligences led to an increasing creativity and new life ways. This allowed homo, sap homo sapiens to arrive at original thoughts, which were creative and relied on metaphor and analogy. 
the evolution of cognitive fluidity led to increasingly creative and efficient modes of subsistence production and to the development of religious ideologies about power and the afterlife. The second model, which we'll actually explore in lecture 2.3, is proposed by a scholar named David Lewis Williams. So Lewis Williams' model was really centered on shamanism. According to Williams, the development of human consciousness led to the creation of religion, art, and new political structures. So for, day, for today, we're just going to focus on Stephen Mithin's idea of cognitive fluidity, and we'll get into Lewis Williams in the next lecture. So Mithin first proposed this model of cognitive fluidity in 1996 in a book called The Prehistory of the Mind. According to Mithin, Cognitive fluidity refers to the interrelatedness of our various domains of intelligence and is a distinctly human ability. For Mithin, our brains resemble a cathedral composed of different types of intelligences, natural history, general, technical, linguistic, and social intelligence. These five different types of intellectual skills were fundamentally separate in our distant hominin ancestors. To put it another way, all knowledge about the specific domain that one was thinking in, for instance, technical intelligence, is contained within that one part of the chapel and cannot be found anywhere else in the mind. Over time, these separate types of intelligent intelligences became interconnected due to genetic mutations, inheritance, environmental change, and processes of natural selection. So Mithin kind of sets up this transformation from compartmentalized intelligences to interconnected intelligences into three phases. So in phase one in Mithin's model, our hominin ancestors primarily relied on only three types of intelligences. General intelligence, which refers to the kind of basic learning and decision-making skills. Social intelligence, which refers to skills in interacting and communicating. And then natural history intelligence, basically our ability to know the environment. So phase one in this model is found in our way distant ancestors, chimpanzees. So even chimpanzees have these basic, three basic types of general, social, and natural history intelligence. In phase two of our kind of cognitive evolution, hominins developed additional types of intelligences, including technical skills. This phase is represented in our discussion of stone tool technologies roughly 2.5 million years ago. Particularly, think back to our lecture about the Industrial Revolution and our ancestor Homo habilis. So as we discussed in lecture 1.3, Homo habilis was living in larger groups and had the ability to make tools and to construct mental maps of the locations of important plants, animals, and natural resources. So our Homo habilis ancestors had general, social, natural history, and technical intelligence. But remember, all these intelligences are still separate at this point. While Homo habilis had more complex intelligences, it's important to recognize that their knowledge about different behavioral domains was not being combined. We have to wait till we get to phase three for that to happen. So over the course of the next about 100,000 years, there's a dramatic increase in the technical skills of hominins. 
Rather than just creating sharp edges on, on rocks, Homo erectus was able to create hand axes with higher degrees of symmetry. These new tools were combined with a more efficient approach to hunting and foraging through social cooperation and natural history intelligence. Evidence for the development of predictive behavior based on natural, natural intelligence is also present in Homo ergaster and Homo erectus. So in phase three, Mithen hypothesizes that the Homo genus began to develop linguistic intelligence. There are several lines of evidence for the emergence of language among our hominin ancestors roughly 1.8 million years ago. First, there's an expansion of the Broca area with the emergence of Homo habilis. And this expansion of the Broca area is related to linguistic comprehension and production. We also see increased stone tool production and social collaboration with our ancestors Homo ergaster. This kind of new tool production and social collaboration skills are correlated with the expansion of the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in semantic memory. Finally, there is neurological evidence that shows that the cognitive processes of flint napping, that is making tools, actually mirrors cognitive processes of sentence construction. So we see a very tight correlation here between the ability and the perfection of stone tool skills, the capacity for linguistic communication, and anatomical or morphological changes in the skull structure and the brain structure linked to these linguistic abilities. So during phase three, there's these five intelligences, right? Social, linguistic, natural history, general, and technical intelligences that become interconnected so that any given behavior will draw on and actually harmonize previously isolated intelligences within the brain. So in the kind of summary, roughly 40,000 years ago, we see the neurological linkage of general, social, natural, technical, and linguistic intelligences in our ancestors Homo ergaster and moving into our ancestors Homo sapiens. This linkage is what Mithen calls cognitive fluidity. Basically, cognitive fluidity refers to our ability to develop and express symbolic behaviors. So there's several examples of symbolic behaviors which appear in the archeological record in Africa and Europe between about 300,000 and 500,000 years before present. The first type of symbolic behavior that we see is associated with the corpse. As we discussed in lecture 2.1, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens buried their dead in apparently significant and symbolic ways. Another example of symbolism during this time period is associated with the use of beads. Beads appear in the archeological record by about 75,000 years before present, particularly in South Africa. But recent research also suggests the sporadic appearance in North Africa and the Levant or the Middle East of, of beadwork all the way back to about 90,000 years before present. One example of the use of beads, pendants, and other personal decorations comes from the Sungir site in Russia. This burial contained the remains of a 60-year-old man along with over 2,000 beads arranged in strands on all parts of the man's body. These beads were certainly decoration, but they may have also sent a social message about the status and affiliation of this buried man. 
There are also several examples of the use of pigment to symbolize social status and burials, dating to this 300 to 500,000 year period. Specifically, red ochre is found at many African Middle Stone Age sites, as well as occupations in the Middle East, Australia, and Europe. But why, why red? Why do we start to see the appearance of red ochre in particular being used in burial context in places as disparate as Africa, Australia, and Europe? Well, one theory is that red ochre, this kind of pigment that we often see in the archeological record is used in ritual contexts especially in relation to monarchical observances. For example, ethnographic studies among the Khoisan people in Namibia indicate that they use red iron oxide during menstruation to signal imminent fertility. In this context, redness is used to signal flows of blood and supernatural potency. So we might imagine that similar to contemporary examples of the use of red ochre in the Khoisan context, our ancient ancestors may have been using red to signal fertility and potency and supernatural power. In addition to creating symbols through things like pigmentation and beads, cognitive fluidity is linked to the development of what's called anthropomorphic and totemic thinking. Anthropomorphic thinking combines our natural intelligences, that is thinking about animals, with our social intelligences, that is thinking about people. The result is our ability to think about animals as people. For example, when we attribute feelings to dogs and cats. Totemic thinking, on the other hand, involves the same combination of social and natural intelligences, but goes one step further. Totemic thinking involves thinking about animals as people and people as animals. This entails placing humans on the same playing field as other non-human animals, instead of just thinking that humans are distinct. An example of totemic thinking is shown here from cave art found at the Le Trois Frères site in France. This image depicts a small, half-human, half-bull sorcerer who is playing a nose flute, a perfect example of people thinking as animals and animals thinking as people. This ability to think about animals as people may have actually helped modern humans with regards to hunting. Anthropomorphizing animals by attributing them human personalities is an effective predictor of animal behavior. This would have allowed modern homo sapiens to develop new types of hunting weapons based on predictions of animal behavior. The ability to predict the movements of animals would also have allowed our hominin ancestors to generate more effective hunting strategies. So totemic thinking and anthropomorphic thinking is not just about art or power, but it's also about the very practical work of hunting. Anthropomorphic images in cave paintings, like those from Le Trois Frères, suggest that upper Paleolithic people and beliefs in supernatural beings had beliefs in supernatural beings and maybe even in an afterlife, and that they may have been trying to communicate with supernatural entities through rituals. I'll close by providing one last example of all of these kind of symbolic traits that come together in one site called Bolombo's Cave in South Africa. So this cave, Bolombo's Cave, was excavated during the late 1990s and early 2000s. 
The oldest material within the site date to about 75,000 years before present, and it appears that the last occupation of the cave would have occurred about 50,000 years ago. The most dominant artifact in the assemblage from the cave are what's called bifacial points, that is stone tools worked on both sides. These are known as bay, still bay points and were likely used as spearheads. Other artifacts found at the site were made of non-local raw materials, suggesting that the cave's inhabitants were traveling large distances to acquire specific material. Some of these tools show evidence of being hafted that is bound to a shaft of some type or other. The distribution of stone tools and debris within the cave suggests that the inhabitants had developed a clear sense of spatial organization. Excavations at Belumbos also uncovered about 20 pieces of worked bone, probably seal bone. Most of these bones have been shaped and used for the purpose of piercing, gouging, or drilling. So these were tools used to make things like beads and other, and clothing. Two of these bone tools were worked into really thin points with polishing and grinding and possibly even firing. These are the first bone artifacts that have been associated with an assemblage older than 40,000 years ago. In addition to all sorts of, sh of fish and shellfish remains, 41 thick shells with drilled holes for suspension were found providing early evidence for the creation of jewelry using shell beads. And perhaps most significantly, Belumbos contains evidence for the oldest dated art in the world. In 2002, archaeologists discovered two pieces of rock covered in red ochre and decorated with abstract crosshatch designs. These designs were made by holding a piece of ochre with one hand while impressing lines with the tip of a stone tool. Now, the use of ochre in Belumbo's cave has been pushed back to 100,000 years, making the use of red paint in symbolic context even more ancient than we had originally thought. In 2011, archaeologists found both red and yellow pigment within shell containers, as well as grinding cobbles and bone spatulas used to work up a paste that was then applied to this, these pieces of rock. Chemical analysis of the residues and shells point strongly to the production of paints. The ochre may have been used to paint bodies or animal skins or even on cave walls. All of these artifacts at Belumbos point to the development of a sophisticated symbolic system linked to the emergence of ritual beliefs around burial practices. In lecture 2.3, we'll dive deeper into this emerging symbolic system.